let me just thank all of you for coming and welcome you, and especially welcome our distinguished guest, Attorney General Eric Holder. Former Attorney General Eric Holder was in South Carolina yesterday. But unlike every other Democrat, he's not here to win votes. I'm going to be here um, just today because I'm on my way to Iowa, and then we're going to New Hampshire uh, next week. I'm not running for president. <laughs> I'm the only Democrat, uh, I think, uh, I, the only Democrats who are not running for president. You know? Holder is actually in this early primary state to get local Democratic leaders to help him make gerrymandering, the manipulation of political boundaries to aid one party, an issue in the 2020 primary. People always say to me, well, you know, gerrymandering, yeah, it's kind of wonky, you know, redistricting. What, is, what does that all mean, you know? Well, if you care about reproductive rights, uh, if you care about um, gun safety, if you care about closing the Charleston loophole, all stuff is intertwined. Um, because if we elect, and we will elect a Democrat in 2020, I'm confident of that, we will elect a Democrat in 2020. But he or she could be hobbled by a gerrymandered House of Representatives. But there's another issue everyone wants the former attorney general to weigh in on. How would you assess William Barr's handling of the Mueller report uh, thus far? You know, I think it's shameful. Um, an attorney general is not the lawyer for the president. An attorney general is a lawyer for the people of the United States. I was the deputy attorney general during the Clinton administration when we wrote the regulations that um, resulted in Bob Mueller's appointment. We never assumed when we wrote those regulations that we would have a problematic attorney general, you know? I, I, I wouldn't say we were being naive, we were just kind of looking at our history, you know? We had a couple of bad attorneys general, but you know, generally you know, pretty good. If we could do it over again, we would have written them slightly differently. What would you have written differently? I would not have given as prominent a role to the attorney general in terms of where the report goes. Um, maybe I would have said, you know, a simultaneous um, disclosure of the report to the attorney general, as well as to maybe the chairman of the, the chairman, chair of people of the uh, House Judiciary Committee and maybe the Senate Judiciary Committee, something along those lines, with the understanding that it had to um, be kept private unless all three of them decided that it was going to be made public. Something like that, so you could get it out of the executive branch. Do you believe the president can be prosecuted? Yes. Like in court? Yeah. I while think, he's president? Yes. I think the OLC opinion is wrong. The OLC opinion focuses on the fact that if you indict a sitting president, it will paralyze the executive branch. And I don't... Well, but you know what? If a president is impeached, that has an equally paralyzing um, impact. But the reality also is that the executive branch can function. This is Holder's current balancing act. Everybody needs to get behind me. If you want a photo, or give me no more photos. Get people in the room with the hope that he'll talk about Mueller and President Trump and then inject his real message into the conversation. For Holder, this mission has its roots in the 2010 election. The Republicans will take control of the House of Representatives. That's the one where Democrats lost the House, lost seats in the Senate, and had almost no influence in the state legislatures that would redistrict in 2011. Post-presidency, Barack Obama and Holder launched the National Democratic Redistricting Committee to promote a comprehensive redistricting strategy. I would ask you, as I said, to make sure that those presidential candidates are focused on ending gerrymandering, that we have a fair redistricting process, but also people at the state level as well, because it's important that they are focused on this as they will be the ones drawing the lines come 2021. So we have this NDRC Fair Districts Pledge that we're asking all the presidential candidates to sign, and so far 19 of them have signed. Which candidate has a plan where they're actually discussing voting rights in a substantial way as well as gerrymandering? Well, you know, I think they all are um, to varying degrees. I, I noticed that, for instance, you know, Mayor Pete, Beto O'Rourke, I think I think about their um, their, their announcement speeches and, yeah. and they, they talked about, you know, uh, unfair um, redistricting and, and, and gerrymandering. The fundraising arm of the NDRC raised $2.5 million in 2018 and has donated a lot of that money to state-level candidates and state parties. Holder says it's paying off. Five states had ballot initiatives that were designed to make the redistricting process more fair. His message of fairness is a pretty good way to advertise the dry, complicated topic of gerrymandering. But he has to balance that with a dose of truth. 
that an even playing field also means that some of those gerrymandered safe seats for Democrats could become real fights. What I always try to do is um, push for the positive, push this notion of fairness, because I'm really convinced that in a fair process, Democrats and progressives will do just fine. Do you think Democrats if they were to gain control, will district fairly? In Maryland, this was actually a problem. The Democrats tried to gerrymander for themselves. Yeah, and Democrats tried to do it in New Jersey. And I spoke out very publicly against what they were doing, and they backed down. And I'm prepared to do that. I'm prepared to take on Democrats who would try to, uh, to gerrymander. We don't need an unlevel playing field. That's what Republicans need. All we need is a level playing field, and we will win. I am confident in that.